to train if your body's constantly trained uh, to run on glucose mm -hmm. to your mitochondria do take a little bit of time to adjust to the fat oxidation aspect yeah, the of lag it. period yeah there's a lag period it doesn't take you very long but a lot of people find that initially when, yeah potentially potentially um potentially depending uh, on the individual of course yeah, depending on the individual. And I think you'll find that individuals that are exercising frequently and probably enter periods of fat oxidation adapt to it a lot quicker than individuals that are just chronic sugar burners. You know, yeah. uh, they do take a little while. And some people in the low carbohydrate communities call that like a low carb flu or a keto flu or whatever it is. But um, it, it, I think it does take a while to build up that mitochondrial density. But we're, we're pretty amazing. We can adapt very, very quickly to things. Um, and I think, you know, really we should be spending a lot of time burning sugar, in particular the extremes of exercise. But during those periods where we're not doing that, we should be fat oxidizing. We should be running on fat, and and I think the body will will do will do that very very well. I, I think you'll find that people on low carbohydrate diets will find that their sugar levels are very very stable, but their ketone levels are always up a little bit. It's almost like the body's utilizing both fuels together. It's not that you need to run on one or the other. Um, as humans, we can be very, very binary, but it's not that. It, it is it is much more complex than that. The body will will kind of uh, regulate everything nicely for the individual. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it makes me think of the thermogenic effect of food. So you spoke a lot about en energy balance earlier, um, and we still need glucose, particularly for brain function, as you mentioned. But if we're consuming carbohydrates, there's a very small thermogenic effect of food there comparison to protein where we get about 30 to 40% of those calories mitigated through the digestive process in producing heat. Exactly right. The dietary um, effect of protein or, or dietary and uh, diet induced thermogenesis, DIT for short, extremely important philosophy to kind of understand. And actually, one of the critical roles of why, uh, critical reasons why a high protein diet generally will help a person lose weight, it is energetically very, very expensive to process protein and then incorporate it into your body. It takes up a lot of your um, a lot, lot of that energy so essentially 20 percent or 20 to 25 percent of the food eaten has to be 25 um, percent of that energy has to go towards actually breaking that protein down um, you know and and some people experience meat sweats and things like that that's what's going on it's a thermogenic effect um, interestingly high fiber foods can be extremely um, high in their dietary thermogenic effect and also can contribute to satiety, but there's a, a little bit of a limit to how much of that people can consume uh, because fiber for some, uh, it's not really well tolerated. And that is a limit that we've got as humans. Um, you know, we're not, we're not uh, although it's forced on us as a, a high fiber diet, not all of us are all that well adapt at dealing with in particular insoluble fiber, which is found in certain foods. Uh, fat, interestingly, um, actually has the lowest uh, thermic effect, which I find uh, very, very interesting. And this is why I'm always quick to point out that, that um, people in these low carbohydrate communities, in particular, the ketogenic groups, sometimes yep. often stall. Uh, they do stall with their weight loss and they find that their sugars can rebound very, very high uh, when they're over consuming fat because fat- has So actually inducing almost insulin resistance. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, and that you've got to be very cautious of that. I think one of the reasons the ketogenic diet has been successful is because of the, the, the high protein intake. It, people tend to eat a lot of meat on ketogenic diets. Uh, yeah. But the classic ketogenic diet is very, very high in fat, very low in protein, has absolutely abysmal adherence. Um, yeah. you know, and, that's, and, I, and I'm a bit like you in the way that um, I try not to put myself under a banner of one of these titles and more so simplify it because yes. most people, it's not an issue of, you know, we're going 10, 10 grams of fat too much here or 40 grams of carbs too much here, the, those intricate details when there's no consistency with their relationship with food anyway. It's just more that they're, um, I'm completely run out where I'm actually going with that, but it's just, we're trying to simplify it and going, look, if it was provided by the earth, chances are your body will probably be okay consuming it. If it wasn't, you're probably not going to appreciate it. 100%, 100%. The, the real issue is always being processed food. There is no thermic effect because it's very easy. It just essentially liquefies immediately and is absorbed by the gut. It's a terrible, terrible way to eat. 
Um, and that's the but, issue with thermi, uh, with processed food. Sorry, sorry, Jack, go on. That's okay. You, you, you mentioned the word there about losing weight and I'm sure we would probably, when we're looking at weight loss, we don't really ever want to see someone losing muscle. We want them to ideally be losing fat because holding a, uh, a certain degree of muscle mass is going to be very, I suppose, advantageous for people's health metrics and metabolic status. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think um, there was the Ansel Key starvation experiment in the 1960s. Were you aware of this, uh, Jack? Um, not the particular, but either yeah. way, I say it to people all the time. If we're looking at starvation, you know, there's no such person as a fat. There's no such thing as a fat person in a prisoner or war camp. But that's, that's not right. exactly what we're going for here. They're not having yeah. a good time. Exactly. This was a really interesting experiment. So they took a few men who were conscientious objectors to the war at the time in the 60s, um, very very fit young men, um, sort of in your age group, and uh, put them through regular amount of exercise. I think they'd walk something like, you know, 10 kilometers every day. It wasn't particularly arduous or high intensity, but the critical thing is they calorie restricted them to 1600 calories per day. Um, it's, un, uh, it's unclear where those calories came from, but I very much doubt that it was coming from high, high nutrient protein. foods. Yeah, protein. So I think a lot of it was things like macaroni and cheese and breads and a little bit of fruit, a few biscuits. Cheap stuff. Protein. Cheap stuff. So what was interesting in this experiment, it's such a fascinating experiment and a cruel one as that, is these men started losing huge amounts of muscle mass. Of course they lost fat mass, but they lost huge amounts of muscle mass. And they looked, as you said, like these people that exist in concentration camps. Now at that end of that experiment, and it's 27 weeks, a lot of them had psychological disturbances. In fact, most of them never enjoyed a proper relationship with food again. Um, there was compulsive behaviors. There were strange eating behaviors. Often they would take their food away and want to eat alone. They hoarded food so that they could eat it later. A lot of them became obsessed with food and wanted to become chefs when they left. I think one gentleman actually suffered psychosis. One uh, cut his hand off. Um, yeah, you know, like deep, deep mental disturbance. How long did they do the calorie restriction for? 20, like half a year, six months. Um, but the key thing is they were, they were exercising and they were already fit young men, fit mm -hmm. young, you know, they were ready. To okay. So they were in good support. shape to begin with. Yeah. Good, good shape. So it didn't have much, much fat mass. Now, you know, you take someone with, with significant amounts of fat mass and they, they would be fine because they're burning their own body fat. But in this case, they were starting to tap into their own muscle and bone. And this is the point that I'm trying to make. I think the body's not in a good state if you're fundamentally having to break those two aspects down because that implies significant, significant duress uh, from mm -hmm. the environment. And uh, what, what, which is interesting because a lot of these Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers and things like that, they will restrict people down to eight to 1200 calories. That, that is horrific uh, because mm -hmm. over, uh, what sort of- I know it infuriates me. Yeah, what, what sort of compliance can you get out of that? Now, it's interesting, Jack, there are some days I probably only do 1,200 calories and I'm pretty active sort of a bloke, um, but the 1,200 calories have come from steak and eggs and, 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 and things like this. So there is such good nutrient delivery to the body. In addition, it's uh, lots of satiety. So you can calorie restrict, but you can do it with high satiety. And I think that that is the trick. Um, and you're also doing it in a bit of a zigzag toggling approach, yeah, which yeah. is probably a lot more reflective of our natural relationship with food in that hunter and gatherer lifestyle that we uh, are sort of somewhat promoting. But I mean, we've spoken about red meat a little bit and just to sort of backpedal that so we can move on from the topic of red meat, you know, people that, um, you know, we've eaten red meat for millions of years, as we've discussed, but you'll get this ridiculous counter argument that be like oh but look at the life expectancy of the hunter gatherers um and that's the kind of food that they ate and i feel like that's just a very narrow perspective failing to consider the other lifestyle environmental factors that are going on around us such as let's say clean drinking water hygiene um access to some of the great things that modern medicine and western medicine has done like penicillin and fighting off um infections and whatnot so i'm just interested to hear what more you've got to say about that kind of statement 
Yeah, uh, absolutely, Jack. I posted something just last night, a short little video clip of, um, you know, a bit of a reenaction of Neanderthals hunting in, in, in Europe 53,000 years ago when, in this cold, harsh environment where no plant food could have ever, uh, you know, existed. Existed. So, yeah, and, and they, were, they were hunting down the uh, rhinoceros-type species that lived in Europe, which is a megafaunal type creature, huge animal, and um, two of them die in that accident, in, in that hunt. But they rejoice because they've got fuel for the rest of their their population now, which they can take back. So hunter gatherers, that their their life is extremely harsh. They exist in an extremely harsh environment. Um, Again, as you pointed out, clean drinking water was a is, a is a complete luxury that we've forgotten. I think one of the biggest things that have contributed to our longevity is nothing to do with modern medicine per se, more, more to do with our public health measures such as vaccinations, right, um, such as antibiotics, as you've said, but also things like seat belts, clean drinking water, fire alarms, road safety, uh, so many aspects of that have contributed screening um, tools that we use like bowel cancer screening, breast cancer screening. Modern medicines just plug the gap of chronic illness. It has done nothing to increase uh, length of life. I think most of the data would concur with that. So, yeah, I mean, in a situation where we've got a hunter-gatherer-esque uh, lifestyle but have access to all those other benefits well i wonder what the uh, length of life could be i think i think you know most uh, most certainly mo most of us have the capacity to reach that you know that, that 90 to 100 years of age without the pitfalls of all the chronic illnesses that befalls us in the modern era i agree with what you're saying but i feel like the um where we're maybe failing on the execution level is there seems to be quite a gap uh, between good nutritional understanding and let's say a larger percentage of um, Western trained medical professionals. You're certainly not one of them, but we're still hearing things from GPs from time to time saying, you know, avoiding saturated fats and you got to lower your cholesterol and, um, you know, statements like red meat is bad. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do is be a little bit of a stepping stone somewhere along the line in between those two things, recognizing full well that I'm never going to have the expertise and knowledge that you have acquired through your formal studies, but um, people need to start somewhere. Uh, Jack, I appreciate what you guys do immensely. You know, there's coaches out there, personal trainers out there, um, health coaches. Oh, oh, this is, these are amazing people. I, I actually, uh, I tend to gravitate towards surrounding myself with people like yourself uh, rather than my own colleagues. I'm very, I'm very, um, I'm very uh, crestfallen at the state of healthcare at the moment. I think I've put out stats before that you know 60 to 65 percent of doctors themselves are overweight. So really, you know, if these are the people that are that are kind of you know lead us into health, I think we're yeah. in, we're in we're in trouble here um, because it's really not a preventative model. Um, you know, med school kind of teaches us the food pyramid, but the food pyramid is designed for those that are healthy and well. I mean, at the bottom of that food pyramid, it states in the Australian Healthy Eating Guidelines that if you're well, diseased, upside down. Yeah, yeah, well, but, but also if you're if you're diseased or elderly or growing, this food pyramid doesn't apply to you. But how much of our population is diseased now? Possibly seventy five percent, right? Yeah. So, so then you sort of go, well, perhaps we should be doing things a little bit differently. Um, unfortunately, I think in the healthcare sector, the focus on movement and diet is extremely poor. Yeah. Um, I think I, I'm I'm lucky in the sense that I've always been surrounded by uh, people uh, playing sport and 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 you know got into gym very very early. So I've always had a bit of an interest on it. But especially in the last five years, it's been interesting for me to apply that to actual patients and see benefits for them. You know and and, and I think we should be doing it more, but gee, it's an uphill struggle. Uh, Cause yeah. it's, as, as you know, it's very difficult. Mate, to to it lifestyle. definitely is an uphill struggle. And I think interesting is a very good word to describe it because as much as I've appreciate your compliment in return there for the role that we're trying to all uh, synchronize in, um, you know, the health and fitness or wellness industry is, has a lot of, blurred lines and moving parts so we've got the bodybuilding industry we've got powerlifting we've got G general population we've got special athletes we've got digestive and um, you know chronic illness sort of people and unfortunately bodybuilding for example is very popular 
And we have now entered a, a learning environment, which is Instagram and social media, which has painted this fallacy of authority with a lot of people that have just chosen the right parents, have got very good genetics and are, and are young at the moment. So they, they're willing to show their ass on, on camera. And now 